Thank you very much. I really wish to thank the Turin Foundation and the organizer for this invitation. I also have, a, I guess, a confession to make. This is my first ESDR meeting. Uh, in Italy, they say no, uh, it's never too late, so I hope to be back. Um, and uh, so I actually would like to talk about something that I became very interested is the notion of cancer fields. And so the idea that cancer is not only a problem of a few clump of cells, but actually all cha changes occurring in a large uh, tissue uh, or a field of tissue organs, which has similar, uh, similarities to developmental fields. So as you know, and you are clinicians, so you know better than I do, that field cancerization is a major problem in many clinical conditions, uh, notoriously also in the skin, in immune-suppressed uh, uh, patients. And uh, so what I also find it conceptually very attractive is the idea of cancer field therapy, what can be done to actually uh, treat large regions of, uh, of a tissue, oh, sorry, um, that are, okay. Um, cancer field therapy, what can be done to treat large tissues, a large part of a tissue with pre-malignant and malignant lesions. And so I like to suggest, and at the end, I will show some example where I think that targeting the epigenome could be actually be advantageous also to, uh, for this kind of uh, cancer field therapy. Uh, the other concept that I think is quite important is that actually the spread, uh, spreading of these lesions, uh, one reason is obviously the possible spread of uh, abnormal epithelial cells, but another important reason is probably just changes in the stroma which could also play uh, even a primary role. And for that, we actually had a mouse genetic model suggesting that can actually be indeed the case, in a, at least in a mouse. So for many years, as Irvin mentioned, uh, we've been focusing on the role of notch signaling and actually inter interconnection with P53 in the epithelial cells. Squamous cell carcinoma is actually the focus of most of our work. And so this, actually, this is from an old review a few years ago that I, we wrote. Um, but actually here I added a lot of other cell types and clearly squamous cell cancer, like many other cancer, is very heterogeneous. And so we actually what I'm going to talk about today is actually the role of the same notch signaling pathway and the interplay with P53, not in the squamous cells themselves, but in cancer-associated fibroblasts. And uh, this is also very interesting because um, there is a lot of work suggesting that um, senescence of stromal cells, stromal fibroblasts, uh, can actually predispose to cancer formation and explain at least in part the exponential increase of cancer risk uh, with age. And so work pioneer, for instance, by Judy Campisi and others, show that senescent fibroblasts, they produce a battery of cytokines, growth factors, metalloproteases that can talk back to epithelial cells directly or through uh, induction of uh, inflammation. But an important change here is actually out of the senescence of these fibroblasts around these nascent tumors. There is, however, another school of thought that is focusing on cancer-associated fibroblasts, actually the fibroblasts that are found around tumors. And it's actually interesting to note that most people that focus on cancer-associated fibroblasts, they rarely talk about senescence. And because uh, around established tumors, these fibroblasts, they often uh, and show increased proliferation or certainly increased density and fibrosis. So can one actually reconcile the two things, senescence and slow of growth with increased proliferation or increased density? So that's actually what we've been uh, busy studying for the last few years and trying to address two questions. One is whether we can identify transcription and especially epigenetic mechanisms that can be actually, that are involved in uh, this transition from stromal fibroblasts into calves. And the second, where this process is actually a multi-step process, like very much what you think about multi-step cancer development, and whether this process can also be targeted. So notch signaling is our favorite pathway. We just look at notch everywhere. Um, it's a very important form of direct cell-cell communication with the ligands that are expressed by a cell. Transmembrane proteins activate the receptor. 
And then this receptor, when it's activated, goes to the nucleus and converts a DNA binding protein, which is called CSL or RBPJK or CBF1, depending on the, on the studies. We usually call this CSL. So it, this protein usually is a repressor of transcription and by activation of the pathway is converted into an activator. And so in classical studies in Drosophila have shown that uh, compromise, uh, compromise not signaling results in alteration of these fields, developmental fields. As I said, I would like to make a, an analogy between developmental fields and cancer fields. Um, conceptually, notch is uh, really uh, sort of seems very simple, but actually the more you look at, into that, the more complex it becomes. And one uh, important element of this complexity is this protein CSL itself. As I mentioned, under basal condition, this CSL is a repressor of gene transcription. And when NOTCH is activated, it's translocation of the receptor to the nucleus, and this becomes an activator, so you have induction of target genes. But because this protein is a constitutive repressor, you can actually have induction of the same target genes, not only when you have NOTCH activation, but also when you have down modulation of the CSL protein. And this is important for uh, all our work, uh, because now we actually have focused entirely on this uh, CSL protein, this DNA binding protein. And uh, a few years ago, we showed that actually mesenchymal deletion of the CSL gene uh, in mice results in a multifocal keratinocyte tumor uh, that actually are preceded by stroma uh, atrophy. Oops, I have a problem with that. Uh, uh, preceded by stroma atrophy and inflammation. This is actually an imaging system that is also used in the clinic. We can actually lose, uh, and enable to, uh, to, show, to, uh, to see these uh, multifocal lesions that develop over time, which actually can be suppressed by anti-inflammatory agents. Um, at the same time that suppression of CSL is inducing uh, this transcription program that leads to activation of cancer-associated fibroblasts, uh, the same loss or silence of CSL in mouse or in human fibroblasts is actually inducing senescence. So I said at the beginning, an early step in all this sequence of events, we like to think, is actually stromal fibroblast senescence, which is reproduced by just simply uh, silencing or deletion of the CSL gene. Um, biochemically, we actually found that this CSL protein actually can directly bind to P53. This is actually, we bought the P53 and the CSL protein, mix them. There is a, like some kind of biochemical method that you can actually measure the affinity, the binding affinity of one for the other. And then by a variety of assay, we show that P CSL binding to P53 is actually suppressing its activity. And so this is the working model that we are presently working on, is that under basal condition, we think that the CSL protein, which actually uh, independently or in parallel with notch signaling, is actually functioning as a repressor of both P53, and actually directly also can repress senescence genes, and at the same time is also repressing a, vari a variety of inflammatory cytokines, MMPs, and so forth. And so this was shown by chromatin immunoprecipitation assay, for instance. Then I don't have time to show, but actually treatment of uh, human or mouse uh, skin, uh, human skin explants, for instance, with UVA, is actually causing a down modulation of CSL expression. And so this is actually a very interesting area of research. Not very much is known about control of CSL expression. A lot is known about notch activation, but not so much of what is controlling expression of this repressor. So at these early steps, when this silencing occurs, or the downmodulation of this protein occurs, there is act uh, activation of P53 activity. There is induction of stromal senescence. But at the same time, there is already some induction of CAF effector genes. And later on, uh, we actually again focus on a show that actually not only you can actually have down modulation of CSL expression, but also expression of the P53 gene itself can be down modulated. This again is something that is not uh, probably not enough attention has been given to the fact that P53 is controlled not only post transcriptionally, but also at the transcriptional level. For instance, uh, AP1 family members can directly down regulate P53 expression. 
So these late stages in this uh, uh, completely, like we like to think, fully activated cancer-associated fibroblast, you have escape from cellular senescence because P53 is also downmodulated. And there is evidence from our laboratory and others that actually P53 can also function as a transcriptional repressor, not an inducer of transcription. And a number of CAF, uh, effector genes of this uh, cancer-associated fibroblast program are actually so over-induced um, when uh, both CSL and P53 are silenced. Um, and so this was actually published uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, and luckily the reviewers didn't ask for this experiment, so we had time to continue. And so this is now looking at, uh, this is uh, now looking at mice, where actually we combine, uh, combine deletion of both the CSL and the P53 gene to look at, very, very validate genetically what I just told you. And so you can see at early times, mice with a single deletion of CSL, they start developing these multifocal lesions, but clearly the program, the, this uh, cancer field cancerization is really exacer exacerbated when you actually delete both CSL and P53. And in this double knockout, for instance, expression of tenacity in C is usually induced, again, very early on after birth, about uh, four weeks. And also, you can find in the same double knockout, there is extensive fibrosis. And so this is actually Martin Rocken is sitting in the front row there. And we've been talking about the role of fibrosis in actually promoting cancer development. So this is an area we're actually in, very interested in. And so now we have done all, and we are doing a sort of uh, biochemical analysis, finding that actually the combined loss of CSL and P53 they actually lead to a cytokine cascade that we think is important in all this. Now, let's focus uh, for a minute on a fully activated cancer-associated fibroblast and uh, mention a review by Rago Kaluri that came out like a year ago, uh, pointing to the fact that this cancer-associated fibroblast, not only there is an activation of a variety of signaling pathways and the regulated transcription of all these genes, but also there is metabolic reprogramming. For instance, they start making more lactate. Now, autophagy uh, is, is playing an important role in metabolic reprogramming of cells through mitophagy, degradation of mitochondria, which in turn increases or enhances aerobic glycolysis and production of lactate. And then, uh, for instance, work by Paul Slizanti and others uh, suggested that there is a production, for instance, of lactate from cancer-associated fibroblasts that can talk back to cancer cells. And so in human dermal, primary human dermal fibroblast, uh, when we silence CSL, and so this is working all the time and it's uh, very robust with many primary fibroblasts from many individuals, um, the silencing of the protein is resulting in uh, uh, what is called mitophagy, which means actually the number of mitochondria in these cells go down and with an increase of lactate. Um, a key regulator of autophagy are kinases of the ORC family, ORC 1, 2, and 3. And uh, we find that one of them, this ULF3 kinase gene, is actually a direct target of CSL, which I, I remind you, it's a repressor of transcription. So when you silence the repressor, is actually upregulation of, so this is chromatin immunoprecipitation, showing that CSL binds to specific regions of the, this ULF3 gene. And these are other evidence um, there is actually upregulation of the kinase itself which quite interestingly is actually it's a nuclear kinase. Um, this increased UL3 expression is not limited to this in vitro system. You can actually, by laser capture microdissection, you can capture fibroblast underneath actinic keratosis lesions, and you can find by LCM and RT-PCR increased expression, UL3 immunofluorescence the same. And even in culture cancer-associated fibroblast, culture in parallel with fibula from normal skin from the same patient, there is upregulation of UL3. So UL3 is controlling uh, autophagy, is controlling metophagy, is controlling metabolic reprogramming, 
but has also been reported to actually function as an activator of sonic headshock and glee signaling. And this is a second major signaling pathway that is important in epithelial stromal interaction. And, and so actually this was previously reported by other people in, uh, in system where they overexpress the proteins. There is UL3, which again, as I said, is a nuclear protein, can directly bind to GLE2. We confirmed this data, but also by proximity ligation assay, we can find that the endogenous proteins in fibroblasts, they also associate. And the effect of silencing on the ability, so uh, silencing of CSL will induce GLE activation. This is just by Western blood. You can actually see appearance of activated GLE2. Transcriptionally, again, this induction of GLE1 or GLE2 is a measure of activation. And in cells where you concomitantly silence UL3, you actually suppress that. At the same time, you suppress, <coughs> you suppress uh, uh, calf, uh, expression of calf effector genes like IL6. And finally, so uh, UL3 is overexpressed in this uh, cancer-associated fibroblast, so if you silence the gene, and we routinely use this uh, uh, ear injection assay, like very much the fact that mice have two ears, and so you can inject one combination of cells on one ear and the, con the other combination on the other, so you have built-in internal control. And so this cancer-associated fibroblast in which we silence uh, all three, they actually decrease, um, uh, slow down uh, the tumor growth, and as well as uh, slow down, for instance, induction of uh, cancer-associated matrix proteins like tenacin C, periostin, and induction, and also uh, angiogenesis. And so this is uh, the, what we actually just came out uh, with. Uh, we just think that uh, UL3 is a critical target of the CSL protein that actually links CSL to GLE2 in this sequence of events that leads to calf activation. So the final uh, little vignette is actually focusing on other work that we also just came out very recently. And I'll show you only a couple of um, slides on this, but basically we are very much interested in, so clearly CSL is working at the level of transcription chromatin. We identify another transcription factor which is also involved in this whole thing. Both of them are controlled by UVA, expression of them, and smoke. Um, and uh, um, it's actually, so we identify biochemically and functionally that silencing of CSL or silencing of the ATF3 in a human dermal fibroblast is inducing this uh, a transcription event connected with calf activation. And then if, if you're looking at the chromatin profile, this is uh, histone H3K27 acetylation that are induced by the silencing of CSL or the silencing of ATF3, they are incredibly overlapping. And this is actually, the, this is a, the whole chromosomal level, and this is the level of a key gene like IL-6. Um, this is, uh, again, mot uh, acetylated histones. This is pol 2 recruitment. Uh, which actually occurs the same way. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we think that uh, targeting the epigenome could be quite interesting. And so we actually evaluated the effect of BET inhibitors in this context. And so treatment of uh, human dermal fibroblast in vitro with these BET inhibitors will overcome the effect of CSL or ATF3 silencing and also on clinically um, derived CAFs, it will downmodulate all this battery of genes, not only JQ1, which is the, I guess, the first uh, compound identified, but another or other compounds that are in clinical trials. And here again, we actually tried to see whether these inhibitors could be actually used by topical treatment instead of being given uh, systemically to mice. Again, using these ear injection assays, in this case, we are the same combination of cells, SCC cells and cuffs, treated on one side only with a vehicle or with the BET inhibitors. And for instance, you can see this is a short-term experiment, so it's only a week or two weeks. So the, there is the effect on tumor size is not consistent, but the effect on differentiation markers in the cancer cells themselves is and actually, it turns out that the inhibitor, actually, besides having an effect on fibroblasts, there also an effect on cancer cells, so double benefit. Um, and in the, the level of stroma, for example, alpha smooth muscle actin, 
is strongly downmodulated by this topical treatment. This is a larger capsule uh, microdissection and then quantification of IL-6 and COX in these cuffs that we inject and then when we, in the lesions that uh, are treated with JQ1, both IL-6 and COX-2 are actually decreased. So I didn't, no, I think I'm doing okay. Um, so now I'm sw switching gears. Um, so I'll show you a couple of things, so new directions. I will not show you any data because I've actually been working on this for the last two, three years. We were fortunate enough to have received a very large funding from the European Research Council. And the project that we are now uh, addressing, try to understand the differences in the skin of different human populations. And it turns out that in Lausanne, uh, there is actually a large population of um, people of African descent. So we have a beautiful collection of foreskins from black versus Caucasian uh, young boys. And so there you can imagine that we do all this kind of uh, transcriptomic and genomic and epigenetic analysis to try to understand what could be the difference between individuals of the two populations, which is actually very interesting because Africans have notoriously are much more susceptible to a variety of skin of cancers, not on, uh, skin uh, when they develop melanoma, for example, more aggressive, but they're much more sensitive to um, head and neck or esophageal carcinoma, prostate, breast, and so forth. So we like to think that what we are studying with normal tissue might actually be important for that. So that's one big area of interest is actually this. And of course, we like to put in our network, thinking of network in this context. Um, but that also, the other one, is actually the, not only the race differences, but also race, uh, gender, or sex, I should say, related differences. This is something we actually reviewed like uh, last year, uh, because a lot actually is known about the different susceptibility of female versus males uh, to cancer. Many cancer types, males are much more susceptible, with the exception of thyroid cancer, but most all the others. And it's interesting that these differences between males and females are retained in the black population versus the white. And so actually the difference between black and white uh, in incidence is actually mostly found in the male population and not in the female, at least for head and neck cancer. So I conclude just saying that so we'll become very much interested in cancer prevention. Um, you can define cancer prevention in many ways. Uh, my way of thinking of cancer prevention is secondary prevention, trying to understand the early steps of uh, cancer development, trying to prevent progression. Uh, but another thing that I think is very important is to bring together epidemiologists and basic cell biologists like myself. And so this is actually a meeting that I organized next April. If somebody is interested in participating, they are very welcome. And so these are all the people, um, I cannot, I mean, I actually had the name of some of the people that I mentioned uh, the work uh, while I was talking, like uh, Giuseppina Procopio, Dong Ung Im, and Sandro Gorupi. And then we have a large number of collaborators. I apologize for not including their name, but that's where we set up some kind of a, a cancer prevention institute. There are these dots over here. They correspond to collaborators throughout the world. And I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>